So I'm 29, so 10, 11 years ago, you were like throwing up into a bucket and measuring how much you could get out. And I think that that mentality of like, I don't know how I'm not gonna be doing what I'm doing, but I can't do this anymore is actually how I made it out of a lot of things later that I didn't even realize. It was a very dark year, but my appreciation for life was so sensationalized. So my life that I took on at that time was to save his. He was obviously on substance. He slammed his head in front of me on the cement aggressively. It would have been a better option to witness his death than to survive what it took energetically for me to save him. These days will forever change me as a person, and I used to have a lot of shame about it. We are at Corinne's house right now. It is um, 3.34, so she should be getting up. I'm gonna give her a call because I actually don't know what her apartment number is. Good morning. Morning. Um, what's your apartment number? It is. I'll find it. Okay, and then um, you can actually park in covered or uncovered. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool, I'll see you soon. So honestly though, how do you get up this early? It's pretty tough. <laughs> I um, I do a lot of resting in the middle of the day. I also consider like gradually getting ready. The more you do it, the easier it gets, but yeah. <laughs> I'm never usually eating at home for sure. Um, and then I, I'm like super lazy, like when I said like, oh yeah, I'll be in my car at Sprouts eating because that's what I'll be doing. I didn't really prep, I thought I had old stuff and then, yeah, so. People always think like, oh, 5 a.m., but it's not really 5. <laughs> so, um, I've actually coached at like five or six studios and the schedule's always rotating um, because the, the way they want to see like different coaches' faces, um, and in order for me to be full time, they offer me, so I'm coaching probably upwards of like 28 classes a week right now. So um, in order to get me like that income, they'll skip me between two. I used to manage for in 2017, and then I prefer just coaching. So for me, I have not felt good, like, and we'll probably make another coffee stop on the way. <laughs> coffee is my emotional crutch, so yeah, <laughs> I'm up at 3.30 and then... I've been trying to figure out like my schedule. Obviously today will be super late and then tomorrow I'll do it all again. Okay, <laughs> fit vlog, week 56, day two. I am in a better spiritual place this morning. Yesterday was fucking tough. I could not pull it together. So hopefully we're not drinking bangs into Red Bulls today. That would be the target. So I'm pretty happy with my conditioning level. Um, today is gonna be a low key, low cardio lift. And then I'm supposed to, at some point, magically cook and get food in Tupperwares, which um, we will see about that. So, Hell Week's rolling out. Um, I'm proud of everyone who's finished five out of eight. That's insane, especially if you did five out of eight in um, five days. So, we're going to be rocking and rolling at the QC. And, uh, yeah, I'll try to get a fitness fly on the wall for my lift a little later today. The Fit Vlog started a year ago because I was not working out. Um, I was in a really intense relationship where he was struggling with mental health. So eight months of that, I was working out maybe once every 10 days. And I used to be someone who can like trained whether I was bodybuilding or not, like five days cardio, like just on a regimen. And I started them um, a year ago. So some of them I'm now posting like the OGs. <laughs> um, and I was not motivated to wake up, and I was just like, all right, so the fit vlog started because it was me getting back on my fitness from not even working out ever, and at the time, I was working at an office job five days a week and coaching two days a week, um, and you know, I'm actually only doing part-time coaching, so I was only coaching six classes a week, um, and so I was trying to get back on taking Orange, and so every time I woke up at 5 a.m., I um, would make a, 
a wake up vlog. <laughs> and then that was it. And then I didn't know that I was gonna keep doing it until someone at the 5 a.m. class was like, I wasn't gonna wake up today, but then I was like, let me see what Rin's doing. And she clicked on me and she was like, Rin's fucking awake in her bed right now. And she got to the class. So then I was like, well, fuck it. If it's weird, I'm just gonna keep making these. Um, and now here we are. That's why sometimes I still make them in the morning, even though um, I'm not like pre or post workout. The idea was like, it would always be pre or post workout. I've recently had to stop making them every single time pre and post workout because I've had some issues with people like wanting to be where I am. What do you mean? So if I take a certain class or a certain thing that I'm doing, like yesterday I did CrossFit and I was super careful not to put the location of the CrossFit. Oh, you yeah. mean like following you? Mm -hmm. Like guys or even? Got females and males. Females are actually harder to manage as far as the threat is less, so there's not usually a safety issue, but a social, emotional, spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. um, for sure. So the whole point of like my time working out, unless like I plan it, is a reset for me. Um, no matter how much I love everyone, there's 140 of them. How much thought goes into your vlog before you like, like do you know what kind I'm of what you're gonna talk, yeah. Zero thought. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Maybe some thought, but usually zero thoughts. That's what's so um, insane to me because I never imagined people would watch them because I'm not really designing like a typical, um, this is how you get lean and it's not really educational. It's more from the fitness experiencer and I share pretty much anything and everything on there. Um, I swear a lot on them and that has been fine. And some people would see them, you know, if, you, if I were really thinking <laughs> ahead, Probably some of the content isn't shared, but I think um, wouldn't be shareable, you know, like so. And a lot of times I feel like they're just whining, but it's kind of the whole point is to be like, if you're, you know, you're trying to be fit. So this is what it feels like, guys. Sometimes <laughs> it feels fucking terrible, especially when I was training for my half or the stress or um, now they're more like humorous, but. I tried to be religious about doing them, so like no matter what, I'm gonna post one even if I don't have anything to say. It's the same viewership pretty much mm -hmm. every day. Um, so, Have you gained new customers from that? I have. Interesting. The vlogs make me money for sure. Well, lifting clients, clothing clients, and nutrition clients. And the vlogs have improved my renewal rates for Live Lovey. So I won't ever stop making them and when guys have a problem, I'm like, I don't care. Hi, can I get a large hot coffee with two creams only, no sugar? Okay. And that's all. Just move my coffee from yesterday over here. <laughs> Thank you. Have you received uh, negative feedback from your uh, blogs mm -hmm. or comments? I have interestingly received some no direct DMs from viewers. Um, I have received some slide negative comments actually from peers in the industry as far as, well, they're just, you know, they're just so long, you know, and mostly it's coming from males. <laughs> um, I think that people in my mind who don't like them just wouldn't watch them kind of thing. There's an author that says the content is worth being written even if no one reads it. Or the beauty of the content is in the content, not in the viewership. So that's kind of what I believe in as well. We'll see as it grows. I mean, it's I've handled them better recently as they've gotten bigger and more in-depth or broad as far as subject matter, but at first it was like, God, this is weird. I don't know if I would watch someone all day like this over and over. I probably wouldn't. <laughs> I know, it's so weird. <laughs> it is weird. Um, but they're like, very invested. So invested yeah. viewership is better than a large viewership. They really care, you know.
headed to Orange Theory. On Tuesdays, it's a light <laughs> day, so I will coach 5 a.m. until 8.30 a.m. Sometimes I'll schedule a 9 a.m. nutrition consult. Um, like Friday, I have one, but today I don't. So I'll be able to go lift and possibly cook. Um, and then I coach again at 11.45. And then typically I would have like a 2 p.m. or excuse me, a 1 p.m. client um, lifting. And then I would be back at Orange coaching at three and four o'clock. And then from there I'm done with my Orange employment, any nutrition and lifts for Tuesday nights, and I'll go dance until 9.30 at night. <laughs> I got my second wind, which happens. Um, I definitely crashed pretty hard emotionally, mentally. Um, I think I vlogged it to, on today's series. We are going to dance rehearsal at Metro Arts, so in Phoenix, and I'll be there for three hours until 9.30. So we've been up since? 3.30 in the morning. 3.30, and you're probably not gonna get home till 10? I'll be in bed at 11.30, and then because of my schedule, I'll be back up at 3.30. Um, so out, this hour, I feel fine, but... Once I've been up like 13 hours is when my mind starts to like derail. Yeah. And then around hour, whatever this is, 16, it feels better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so I'll see you there. See you there. <laughs> Eaten yet? I have eaten two of these in the car because the last dance was so I didn't eat enough carbs at all and I died. Oh, I can only imagine. So, yeah, two of these. And before that was just chicken and pesto at 2 30. Fitness started from my dancing. I went basically three years old, ballet, tap, jazz, hip hop, the whole nine yards. And I loved dancing, um, but it was also the only thing I was exposed to as a child from my parents. So I danced through college, and in college I was offered a job to teach a Just Dance exclamation point class. And I just started teaching like jazzercise fitness routines and like lyrical dances and things like that. And then from there, ASU Rec Center is what told me like, wow, you love this. When I was at ASU Rec Center, I was just dancing and kind of lifting, totally not built as muscle mass or anything like that, just taught Zumba and group fit and a whole myriad of things. I would go work for Lifetime Fitness in 2012, and I would actually run half marathons and marathons first. And then in 20, um, 
2013, 2012, I met my then boyfriend. He competed, um, and I got into competing that way. So I started competing in 2014. I had a full-blown eating disorder from 12 to 19 years old. I self-recovered. I was very aggressive, bulimic, and slightly anorexic tendencies. And that's actually where my passion for Live, Love, Eat coaching comes from. I want to teach women how to feel safe around food and feel safe in their body. When I knew I had an issue and I chose to recover, I was basically like, I can't set any weight targets. I can't set any athletic targets because I'm doing it out of self-hate. So finally, when you heal that, you have so much empowerment to be like, I love athleticism and you know what? I like how I look now. I don't even like how I look when I'm on stage. Like three weeks before stage, I'm like, eek. Looking a little bit like a Martian. I'm not so sure <laughs> about this. So I never did that for the looks. I think at the end of the day when I was 19, I was like, this is not, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, but I can't live like this anymore. And I think that that mentality of like, I don't know how I'm not going to be doing what I'm doing, but I can't do this anymore is actually how I made it out of a lot of things later that I didn't even realize. The original releases are actually down here. It was just the tank top um, and the tees. And that was done in, I don't even know, January to February of 2019. And then I did a spring release, which was just the pink mafia, the pink um, tanks, and then I think the black better every day. And so then what happened is I have an air about me that I seem like larger than this shelf. So someone said, um, oh, can I get the mafia tea in black? And I was like, oh, I don't, I was just a text message. I was like, oh, it's just the pink is the color, but blacks are coming out soon. <laughs> and so I made black mafia. Mafia comes from a 2017, um, Basically, I named myself Rin Slay, Slay is to Slaughter, and then Mafia came from the two girls that I was living with in 2017. We made like a Mafia house, and the idea was how to live a more elevated life where you're, you know, you have community, you're, you're challenging yourself. I made really silly YouTube videos that are probably still up there. The concept was born actually before I met my recent ex as far as Mafia house shirts I would write on a whiteboard to get this my roommate out of bed because she was struggling too with her life. You know, make a make a tea, make whatever. And so actually this image is from 2017, this branding from the two women I lived with. They made this for me because I said, I pranced around the house and I was like, people in the town are gonna wear my shirts. Like it's gonna be a thing. Everyone's gonna be in the same shirt and everyone will know that they can live awesome shit. And I'm like, it's Saturday at 9 a.m. They just wanna sleep. They're, you know, chilling, hungover or whatever. And um, they made this image. And when I was going through a tough time, they printed out this image and put it all around my wall. And they bought me those lights in December of 2018. They bought me those lights. After my most recent ex, I just launched really hard into it. Um, but it had already been a brainchild uh, since 2017. That's cool. What's your yeah. favorite piece? Oh, man. That is so hard. When I did my original release, it included the trucker hat in this color only. And all the husbands of the women I worked with loved it. And of course, I was like, of course I have a 30 to 45 year old male style. Because I this is my favorite. Um, and then from there, it's gotten harder. I would say I do love the love the life you live tanks because they're the perfect racer back where you just go out, you feel sexy, you're comfortable, you know, you can work out in it, you could go on a date in it. It's that's definitely my favorite. The most popular is probably these as well and the mafia tees for sure. And all the hats. I don't even. I mean, I had a, I had a blacked out hat. Most of it sold out because. I need to hire someone to do all the other, to do things. I don't have time to sell it. <laughs> so I try not to order things to sell unless I have the time to sell what I already have. It's been crazy. Yeah. And you're coming yeah. out with your winter collection. Hoodies. <laughs> all the hoodies. A normal business would only sell two items at a time, maybe three. I can't help myself. I sell all, I, I can't help myself. There's... I don't know, probably six hoodies. They were really cute. I They're saw them. They're so cute. I like the black one's cropped. The black one is a crop. Yeah. And so that one will do really well. Already, it's only been 12 hours. I think I have eight orders. 
I haven't even costed and priced them out yet. And did you take a picture of this yet? I haven't taken a still photo. There is one in my Instagram. Okay. But I am going to take the before. You're totally right. Um, and then I'll have the warehouse one day. So what's interesting about starting up a company is you need to have, you basically have a minimum order and different things. And like, we're doing pretty well. We're a little in the red, but pretty close to breaking even at this point. I've put an annual post up because we just passed our anniversary and I've moved $7,000 of product by myself which That's is a awesome. lot. So it's not profit, but it helps inform me the scale of to which I'm doing things and actually like making an impact. Um, not because of the revenue coming in because it's not a net profit. It's just amount that's been moved. Um, so I'm trying to work on giving myself credit, but so I had to buy like 140 much. The whole point of the mafia brand is that I want you to remember all the things that I stand for at all times of your day. So coffee, chapstick, the whole thing. Um, I haven't even done much with the chapstick. So these are all the mugs just in my bedroom. There's about 24 in each box. So I had to buy, I think, 144 mugs. So the first ones I did were pink. They say caffeine loves savagery. These are so sexy. These are my favorite, although the black and gray sell more. And then the black ones um, sell more. Now, when this mug came to me, I was very upset because it was not as sexy as this mug because look at the difference in the sizing. So there was a friend of mine, my homegirl, who got a video chat of me. Fucking crazy. I did this whole display where I had to do this one in the back. This is not gonna do. And then I put two other mugs that were sexy by this mug. This mug is not as sexy as the other mug. Everyone loves this mug though. The most thing that I love more than anything else of anything that I sell is my chapsticks. I have chapsticks. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so we haven't done a lot. When you go to events, you might get one. Um, as I'm explaining this, I'm seeing how crazy it is that I've even done it. Done any of this? Like, so the chapsticks actually saved my soul when I was going through a tough time in the summer. My friends and I were like, but there's gonna be chapsticks. And then it was just like, everything's gonna be fine because I made fucking chapsticks. I haven't ever actively sold anything other than just put it, you know, on Instagram. When someone yeah. found that out, they do, actually they should be the person I connect with on the website. Uh, his mom is a good client of mine, great woman, awesome woman. He found that out and she was like, my son is like, what? Like, she has a clothing business. I can't find her on Google. I can't, like, it's unheard of. Like, in the world of digital businesses, like, um, it, it makes them upset because, like, how could I be running a business just off of Instagram? And not in a mean way. They're intelligent. They are so, that's how I need to be doing it, right? I need to be on Google and all that stuff. And um, the mom was like, no, she's just done it through her, through her little vlogs. So are most of your orders local? So most of them are local. Um, my big goal is to be nationwide, which will require a website and a YouTube that is specifically devoted to SM gear. Um, these ones are going to California because they are friends of a gal in Arizona who purchased from me. There is one hat, the original Slay Mafia hat in California. And then, as well, and then yesterday, I was lucky enough to mail to Oklahoma, who was for someone related to Arizona. And then my first unrelated purchase out of state from my vlog viewership went to Florida yesterday. And that was pretty cool, and I did a lot better with myself because normally I would have just been, you know, blah, 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 whatever, whatever. And um, yesterday I took a second to be like, you just sold something nationwide off your blogs. We got this stamp recently. So I actually have amazing friends in my life who love me and who do things. She made this stamp for me. I didn't even know about it. And she messaged me, I have something to show you. And so we have a stamp. The very first orders that went out, I made vlogs about it and I said Nike started somewhere <laughs> is I had her print, because I don't have a printer, that would be crazy. So I had her print the SM logo, I cut it out, I glue sticked it to a piece of cardboard, I punched a hole, I put yarn through it and I put it on the side of the bag. 
And that's how the first orders went out. The silent partner I have to, so that I could order and not worry about like, if I don't sell everything, I can't eat food. That seems like a bad idea. She believed in me and that's given me the safety net. And what's cool is I paid her back three fourths of the original release in seven days. I'm blessed. Like the universe just comes back and takes care of me all the time, all the time. I came to Orange Theory in January 2016, and the recent job that I had right before was pretty intense. So I was a corporate HR benefits specialist, was my official title for a company that was in Tucson. I worked with them for three to four months, and I actually left that job in the middle of the night for safety reasons and had no other job and came back to Chandler, um, which was pretty much the first impactful moment of trauma that I've had that has definitely now that I'm on the other side of it been why I tell people like it's possible like I never would have seen my life the way it is now but in that moment being a 25 year old girl you know just trying to make you know finally have a job that makes sense with her masters and who that's a stable job and all of this stuff like when I left, I actually I actually have coached clients about this, but I did like a parking lot cry where I parked my car at the back of a Walmart and I just sobbed and screamed and was like, I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. And you still at that point didn't know you were gonna have the Mafia House, the No, none the of eat. none of so what's so crazy is Instagram and society sees everything I am now and I was none of that. I was a twenty five year old girl <laughs> named Corinne. I had left my HR job, everyone was doing cocaine and there were guns involved and I scurried in late at night to like leave all my company property and wrote a handwritten note on like a piece of paper that I was leaving, I couldn't work there anymore and I had to leave Tucson the next day because drugs were involved, so safety and all that. And that was the most earth shattering thing other than my eating disorder that I had ever lived through. And I had no sense of where my money was going to come from. I was lucky enough to be living with my boyfriend's family, but still had small bills of my own. And that's when I reached out to a great person at Orange and I said, hey, I'm kind of in town for the Christmas season. Do you need anything like front desk? Like I'm going to apply to HR. HR is where I'm going. And, you know, I just need some cash. And I did that at the GNC that is, that's family owned that have been great to me as well. So for the winter of 2016, I was working for cash at GNC and working at the front desk at Orange and nobody knew who I was. Nobody cared who I was. I wasn't a coach. Um, when I walked into a room, you know, nobody was like, oh my God, rent. You know what I mean? Like it was just, I'm, I was homeless for six days and I stayed kind of somewhere still related to that family. And um, I didn't know how I was going to get approved for a condo because my income was so low and I lied to get, you know, a few people lied for me to get that condo and I moved my stuff in the middle of the night and my super awesome friend at the time, I finally asked him to use his truck to get my mattress from a storage unit. Like it was crazy. From the time I got at the front desk, you know, at Orange, I had left my other boyfriend at the time. All of that family dissipated. It was just me, myself, and I. And quickly, I got the opportunity to coach. So July 2016, about four or five months after Front Desk Orange, I was thrown into coaching, thrown into an opportunity to run a business for the owner. I named it Leg Day. So then I catapulted my whole business with Live, Love, Eat, Food Science, developed everything. Um, I was still managing, then I would manage and, you know, working more franchise work, but still doing my own clientele, still being Instagram Rin at that time was being developed before I met my recent ex, but it was more on the squares and, you know, no vlogs, no stories, none of that very Facebook and Instagram, like, you know, prop kind of at the time, right? It was 2018 Instagram, not almost 2020. And so I met my ex January of 2018. And I still lived my life and then very quickly like just calmed, just calmed way away from social media. And when I left him a year ago, so November of 2018, the same year, um, that's when I started the vlogs. I started them actually after kicking him out of my house 
Um, and I was still with him for about 30 days and then would officially like say to myself and him and my own heart, like, nope. So the vlogs that I was making, I referenced it as my family or I would go see my family or I have family stuff to do, which was saving his life um, and going to ERs and doing a bunch of stuff that at the time I wasn't speaking openly about at all. Um, and so the vlogs only existed when he was out of my house. I met him January of 2018. He is a beautiful soul, um, fell very, very, very in love with each other. And he had had a history of mental health problems that he was very open with me about. And I, at the time too, which hopefully will be getting more functional because I've done a lot of work. When I fall in love, I fall hard. And my soul, my friends talk about like my soul just chooses someone. And the relationship was very amazing. Um, Orange Theory had not seen me with a boyfriend at all, ever. And so they were very excited. I did post him on certain things, like appropriately. And, um, you know, they, they know I'm private, so they, he had come to Orange. He's worked out with members to this day that still take from me, you know. And in March of 2018, he was arrested in front of me at a rodeo. Um, very violent arrest. I had never seen an arrest before. He was in a state that he shouldn't have been in energetically but nothing actually happened. It was like all of a sudden my universe was fine and calm and nobody, like literally there was no fight, there's no nothing. There was a man that said something to him, he said something to the man, and then all of a sudden it was just this bomb went off and that was something that changed me forever for that year. Um, and since then, Basically, we fought his court charges 14 different times going to court. So every time there was a court date, it was a potential threat for a suicide attempt. And I got him driven to those court dates 14 times, sat there, got him out, and he would attempt four times within that year. I've gone to the ER twice with him and into a rehab center twice with him. Um, all four times medically, the most traumatic stories at each moment. Um, that make other people feel uncomfortable. I spent 18 hours trying to get him into a rehab in April of 2018 after he had attempted the first time and that rehab center lost him after saying he would be there for two to three months. I went every day to give him a letter. That was my spiritual commitment to my healing and one day I went my friend at the time was like, let me go with you. And I was like, that's stupid. Like, it's a long drive. Like, why? We got there and they said, we don't have anyone by that name in this facility. And I said, excuse me, what? And all of my nervous system at this point is already super triggered from the arrest and from, I'm very much adrenal fight or flight. I freaked out. We walked around the street that night because the whole point was I needed to be able to go coach. So we had to do what I had to do to get then on a microphone and yell, which is also an adrenal thing. And we called hospitals. I was so lucky to have a smart friend. We called every hospital. We called, we walked, have you seen this man? I thought he was dead on the street, just so traumatized by that first experience. Later we would find that they had dismissed him to an ER. And once they're dismissed, once they create enough damage to themselves in a rehab center, they have to medically dismiss them for care. And they apparently are not equipped to handle that, which is funny because he's in there as suicidal idealization. So this is like the special care center for people who are trying to kill themselves. And he tried to kill himself too much, so you got rid of him. The amount of rage that year was so crazy. So then, once they're in an ER, the ER doesn't have to give them back to the suicidal idealization care. So that rehab center sent him to the ER, and from ER, he's released. So that was experience one. Experience two was a very violent experience in June. He attempted through physical harm on concrete. He took a large amount of pills in front of me, um, further harm on objects in my home, and uh, alcohol. He passed out in my car, which is the only way that I could get him to an ER. They took great care of him there. I was in that hospital with him for five days. They were so respectful. They were amazing there. 
everyone said like you know you're you know you're not going home the psych came in evaluated him and dismissed him to my care after all of the professionals said he was going to go to somewhere where he, where he couldn't kill himself for at least a small amount of time i drove that man back into my home and i got him to an aa meeting because i didn't know what else to do he was dismissed because the psychologist decided that you know really he was just bipolar and that he didn't really actively attempt to kill himself that it was a bipolar symptom of a mood swing um, and that in his right mind, he wouldn't have attempted suicide, even though I was there as a patient advocate telling them the timeline that he's being prescribed this medication under his psych care, that outpatient program is prescribing him the same family of medicine that he typically wants to overdose on. So the outpatient care medicine that's pharmaceutical that's being given to him is triggering him to use greater substance. Once under substance, he violently slammed his forehead on cement in front of me, gashing his head out, and swallowed pills that was his sleeping medicine for his outpatient psychiatry care, and slammed objects on his head in my home, and drank beer and said, I want to die, I want to die, because once that substance is in his body, he's violently suicidal. And the woman decided that it was a bipolar episode and that he wasn't really trying to kill himself. The third attempt, I got him into another different type of care facility. He went in willingly. He had attempted suicide the night before on a Saturday. I went, and go, I went to go coach all my four classes on Sunday. And when I went home, I told my friend, I need to get this man into a care facility today. I did everything energetically to get that man into a car, into like driving. I mean, it's very challenging to get somebody who wants to die into a building that is going to save their life. They want to be dead. So I got that man to the building, which every time is like a miracle, which is why I have the guardian angel wing on my arm, because it shouldn't have even been the case that I could get him there. And when I got him there, they were supposed to keep him. And I was supposed to have like two to three months to like figure out my life. And hopefully this building will allow him not to kill himself. I got a phone call from him the next day. He was on the side of the road in Phoenix, Arizona. Can you imagine? I had just gotten this man into a building that might keep him alive a little longer than I can. I took a photo of myself on the pavement after that attempt, after the third attempt, getting him into that building and how horrifyingly tragic it is to speak with someone who is mentally ill, who thinks that you're horrible for putting them there, but they're gonna be, they're dead. Like they're, they're dying, they're dead. They're dead in front of you now because if you don't save them now, they're dead 20 minutes from now when they decide that they're gonna smash their head on a cement. Whew, I took a photo because I thought one day I might write a book about it. <laughs> And uh, yeah, he was in there, he put himself in there as suicidal idolization. And here I am just recovering. And I get a phone call Monday at 9.30 in the morning after working out at Orange. And it was, hey, Corinne, said, I'm on this and this, can you come get me? I put my blouse on, I drove there, and I picked him up from the side of the fucking road. So then I got him to his outpatient care um, doctor, texted a family friend of his, said, I'm leaving him here, I gotta go to work, and threw a huge fit that, hey, every time you guys prescribe him this and this, which is the song, Macklemore has a song called Drug Dealer, and that's my most favorite song of Macklemore's. Every time you prescribe him this, it triggers him to use this and this, because it's the same family of the stuff that he's been trying to kill himself with, maybe you don't wanna prescribe it anymore. There's a man standing there, he looks fine. He's probably gonna try to kill himself. I have to get to work, so figure it the fuck out, is what I said. So the last attempt was in October of 2018. I had just broken up with him or told him that he had to be out of my house, actually, on October 4th or 5th. And we were still together, but uh, he couldn't be in my home, because that makes sense. But that's a whole nother topic about me. Um, he said he was attempting suicide. I told him to call 911 and I told him, you know, all this stuff. I said, if I come, if I drive over there, will you go to the ER with me? 
And he said, yes. So I did make the choice to go get him and get him into the ER um, as a patient advocate, but not a girlfriend at that fourth attempt. I went to, because I'm a conniving bitch, I went to the same ER that had dismissed him in June because I knew that they had a record of him as a patient. When you get to an ER, so I would, he, I got him there. I proceeded to go at this point to my office job. Um, and they were very relieved to see me. Normally when patients are under there, they don't allow family to see them because they don't know who's a trigger, who's not. They were so relieved. And when I walked in after a few days of him being in the ER, he had smashed his forehead against the wall very violently while I was not there and obviously tried to start physical fights with the male employees because why? Makes sense to me, America. He wants to die. He's in a building keeping him alive. He doesn't have drugs. He doesn't have alcohol. He doesn't have overdose anything. He is in the ER. And so I got there and I was very calm and I saw his face all bloodied. I have photos of it still. And I saw in the pillow, the blood was in the seam of the pillow line and then all on the floor. And, I, and I, when I saw that, I thought to myself, you have now seen too much. And I just stood there and there was a window of his face and all the workers were to the left of me. And they go, has anyone told you about? And I go, it's fine. I said, this man should be dead already. So I know. I went and I sat by him. I just sat there and I sat there. I wasn't crying. And obviously he was restrained, obviously unconscious. This really white pepper, silver hair, glasses guy with glasses comes up to me. He goes, hi. I go, hi. I'm very calm. And he was like, I'm so sorry. Like, we've never seen anything like this. I mean, you know, one second he's fine and happy and making jokes and then you know I'm so sorry like and I was just like it's okay it's so crazy because I don't get to think about it a lot I haven't done a lot of reflection of course there's a lot of therapy that I'm doing now and there's a lot of therapy about what made me be okay in a relationship where I was constantly the saver there's a lot of research on that that I've looked at um I do know now that I should have let I should have let them take him to jail if they were going to take him to jail. Which means he probably would have killed himself, though. It was I have no I have no regret for the year, um, only because now I've seen that I've survived it. It's very questionable at the time. Um, it was the most amazing faith experience I've ever had. And this is, sounds crazy. I actually feel that guardian angels were in my body, um, doing that year and not really me. I have no idea how I didn't lose my job, get into a car accident and die myself because there were three episodes in the car with him. The only thing and the only reason that I have to separate that as a story I'm telling and not my life is because the girl that I was with didn't want a life without him. So I would have, spiritually I was dying because I basically saved his life but I can't be his soulmate. So it gets a little bit tricky metaphysically which is why I have a no contact rule with that um, with him. I don't regret saving his life. Hopefully he uses it for something. If you could say something, if you could meet the younger version of yourself to mm. give her some inspiring message to get her through life, what, what would it be? It's going to be okay. Would be the one shortest, just like that. It's going to be okay.